with the official API, and later on we'll also be talking about D3. This is going to be the first introduction to D3. So especially for the second part of the lecture, the D3 and the event handling and so on, you should really make sure that you understand every single line of code that is on these, like on the website here. Because these are, these are really the fundamentals of D3, and if you get that, um, you will have an easy time in the class. But if you struggle with that, if you struggle with the concepts, you will find it hard. So if you have any questions, ask during the lecture, um, and ask on Piazza, read up on it, and so on. So it's really important that you get the, the, these, these simple D3 concepts today. Um, first, before we get started, um, you should have gotten an email uh, yesterday. Uh, about your homework zero. So we kind of tested out our system to pull your homeworks yesterday and uh, just in case you were wondering, like, we don't really care about when you exactly submitted the homework for homework zero. This is really, the, as you might have guessed from what is in the homework, this is really just for us to test our systems and for you to get used to the process of submitting via GitHub. So um, everybody who got an email is on the safe side. Everybody who did not get an email should approach us uh, after the class in our office hours or write us an email. <coughs> Any questions about the uh, homework zero? No? Great. Um, so let's get started. So in the, in the first lecture on HTML, we've talked about how we can, how we can manually create elements that are uh, into, uh, like added to the DOM and then rendered by browser. Um, then we have talked about JavaScript, how we can use JavaScript programming, uh, the, the JavaScript programming language to like, do things as we know them from C or other programming language. And today we will start to manipulate, like use the JavaScript and the HTML knowledge we've gained to start manipulating the DOM interactive. So we will create our first interactive websites today. Um, so uh, one important thing to note is that um, the DOM, you can, like, you can actually read the DOM directly through the document uh, object. Like there is in every single website, like, the browser essentially creates a document object. So we could simply take a look here um, at this um, website. I'm going to open this in a new browser window. And this is a very simple website, so there isn't too much pollution. And I could go over to inspect element, and what we see here is, of course, the simple DOM here. But we could also do console.log the document. And now what we would get is this document object, this global document object. And this is exactly the same thing as you see up here. So and, and this document object is essentially the standard interface how you can interact uh, with content on, on a website. So let's create something interactively. So, you can see here, like, um, we have the standard HTML header, um, then we have the body, and in the body, there is only a single div. And it's a, it's a, it has the identifier main div, and it has like text in HTML, um, and then we have a script. So what we do here is we, we take this document object and ask for the element that has a specific ID by calling this get element by ID function. And so we know this is main div, because this is up here, um, so once we have done that, we actually store this div in this variable here. And of course I can and should, uh, it doesn't really matter too much, but I should put var here. So now I have the variable main div, and I'm writing it like, and that contains this div. Here. So you can access the div, you can access the ID, and you can access the de text within the, D, uh, in, within the div. So, and um, we can of course lock that. So we can log the main div here. And here you can see, like we have actually really selected the main div and it only contains this particular main div here. So nothing else. Um, and then next we will create a new paragraph element. So that's the how, like this is how you create an element. You call document create element on P. Like you tell, this is how we, actually tell uh, the browser to create a new element of the type p and this is then stored in this new paragraph and this new paragraph we now append the child with this document create text node function and then i'm putting some text here here's some text in a new paragraph that was created dynamically by javascript 
And what I do then, I take this main div, like this um, div that was originally in here, and run append child and add the new paragraph. Okay, and then we have like here the text in HTML, and then we have this dynamically created new uh, paragraph. So if we, for example, remove that, we don't see it anymore. It's still created, but it's not appended anymore. If we add that back, we can see that this is actually added. And if we look now at the, um, at the document uh, object model here, we can see that we have this new paragraph in this div, nested in this div, with this text. So exactly what we were planning to do. Um, so this is like the, the first time we've actually manipulated the DOM dynamically. So pretty simple, um, and we will be talking about things like that uh, for the rest of the class. So um, you can read a little bit about this. We have this create element, create text node, and then get element by ID to retrieve node, and so on. Please take a look at the com uh, of the documentation about the document object um, on the MDN uh, network, uh, on the MDN documentation. Okay, so now we can use a little bit more complete, complicated JavaScript uh, code to actually create a little bit more complicated website. So last time I've introduced functions, so we have talked about two different ways of defining functions. This was one of them, like you did more traditional way, but I could also do this var diff with text is function text. So this is also a possible way of defining a function, and you should get used to this way of defining the function because this allows you to actually pass the function along and so on. So this function really does not a lot, it simply creates a new div and it creates a new text node which it then appends to the div and then returns the result. So like this is a function that we can use later. Now we run a loop, and we've talked about loops, very simple. Uh, we take the main div and we append the child. So this here assumes that we already have a variable main div defined. Um, and then we um, simply append the child to the main div. And this is how that looks. So we get this output here from 0 to 81 because we are simply, what we're doing here is we multiply um, the, the index by itself. So we get like the, these numbers here. And then at the bottom, we append a child um, with, that we specifically created. And so we could do, we could add another one and say y is if with text and my text. <coughs> And then main div dot append <coughs> child y. Or we could, like now we have my text, or we could manipulate this here. Um, we could, for example, um, do two times i instead of i by i, and then we get a different result, of course. So um, play around with this. Um, this is pretty simple. You can use the, the control structures that we learned about last time to act, and then in combination with these methods that we talked about just now to create uh, to create websites dynamically. Of course, we can also control the attributes of elements. For example, for styling and positioning with CSS. So here we have again this div with text function that does exactly the same thing as in the previous example. Um, and then we have. Um, we style the text by setting a position and a color here. So like here we run this div with text. We have three parameters to this function, text, x and y, and x and y obviously are the position. Um, and so what we do here is we run this div with text and we have this node. This is a, like the result, what is stored in this node is a div element that contains the text, like as you can see from the name div with text. Um, and for this div, we set the attribute style. And that's like how this works. It's pretty intuitive, attribute and we set the attribute style to this string here. And here we use string concatenation to dynamically create um, this style. So we have position absolute, so that means we can absolute this, uh, uh, we can use absolute positioning on the web page by pixels. Um, and then we say um, left, we have x plus, uh, so uh, here we have like the variable x that we have in this function. So we, we go um, x pixels to the left and then we go Y pixel from the top. And then we set the color, and the color is, um, I'm assuming here that the color, uh, like text is, um, text is a number, um, which I'm feeding it later, so if that weren't a number, that wouldn't be great. But here I'm running the RGB um, 
way of defining a color in CSS. So in, are, you cannot always define like, colors by color name. You can define colors by their, uh, by their gold. Or you can do this RGB definition where you simply put the color coordinates in, uh, in integers, in three integers, red, green, and blue, between uh, 0 and 255. And so I'm doing a text modulo 255, and that means I will always get an, a valid number. Um, and then, like for the, this is the red component, the green component is zero, and the blue component is zero too. And this then returns a node. And here we just do some uh, uh, angle, like we compute an angle. Um, this is just a helper function. And now we run actually what is actually going on here. We, this is the first time, like these are all function definitions. And down here, this is actually executed first. So we run this, uh, this for loop, and we append the child to the main div at a specific position. Um, and so what we do here is we simply take, like we calculate the position with this uh, radiance function here um, based on the index. And what that looks like is that. So we can see we've now created um, um, this layout. We have dynamically styled um, these numbers and e each of these numbers is in a separate, is in a separate div. So let's uh, take a look at it. So we can see so we can see like every single of those diffs has a style, position absolute, left 100 pixels, top 200 pixels, and then we have color RGB of 90, 0, 0, and the text is 90. So um, this is exactly what we wanted to do. So would, would styles that you set with the JavaScript override CSS yes. styles? Okay. Yes, so essentially like the CSS styles that you said, um, they're parsed first, okay. um, but then later once you have the existing document object model, you can modify that. Okay. So you can always like, you can change every single parameter okay. of the website with JavaScript later. Okay, um, so we can modify things, but we can attach new fields to existing objects. Um, what we did here, um, and now let's do let's let's create a new method like in a, that we call dynamically at runtime. And our goal is to create this little thing here, like an animation <laughs> that essentially uh, spins around. Um, so we have to do a little bit more about that. And this is how we dynamically update uh, the code. So let's go through that. The key idea here <laughs> is really this. So like we use this diff with text again, uh, but what is really important here is this update function. So we have this, um, we add for the node, like this, for every single node, for every single diff in the website, we add this update function. Um, and the function takes a parameter, which is the amount. So how much we want to change that. Um, and then we add the, ex the existing number that we like started out with, and uh, we add the amount to the existing number as this operator here. Um, we update the text content. We we simply like want to also we don't only want to update the position, but we also want to update um, the uh, the text content, and then we update the position again, and set the attributes again, very much like we did before. Uh, we have x and y here, and then here we again have the red color, um, and initially we update it with zero. Um, and then here, down here, we initialize the nodes. So we run this loop very much like we did uh, before. Um, and what is happening here is this, like, how, this is the function that we call every time we want to do an incremental update. So, like it's, this animation consists of like, a sequence of steps. Like every uh, 25 times per, per second, uh, we, we call this tick method. And this tick method runs one single, act, uh, one single update. And here we iterate over all the nodes and update them with an increment of one. So now all is left to do is to call this tick method. And the, the naive implementation would be uh, we simply do this in an endless loop. So we say while true, uh, run tick. And um, you can try this out later if on your own computer. I'm not going to do it because it's actually crashing your browser. Um, so this is an, end, an, an endless loop. Um, and it would simply hog your CPU, at least one of your CPUs, completely, and it will render your browser completely unresponsive. And the thing is, this loop keeps, keeps going, and the browser never gets a chance to update. So this doesn't work. So we need to do something smarter. 
and we can use this tick forever function here. Um, and here in this tick forever function, we call the tick, and then there is a special API call where you can say window request animation frame, and then we pass this. Uh, of, um, this function. So this is a recursive function call, like this tick forever um, is simply called again um, at a specific point. And this is exactly like this window request animation frame is executed every time the browser repaints. So this is exactly what we want. Question? No. no. Just okay. So who, who doesn't know what recursion is? Should we talk about that? Okay, so a recursive call is essentially a, like a self-call. So let's say, uh, in this case here, uh, what we're doing, we have a function that calls itself, like, and that's why it's recursive. So, um, and that keeps going, like th this is essentially infinite. Unless I have some condition here, I could say, like I could keep a counter somewhere, and I could say, call yourself all the time until uh, a certain condition is met, or if I do it like this, this is infinite. And um, yeah, your recursion is a powerful <coughs> programming paradigm um, for, for many things. So if you, for example, want to traverse a tree, that would be like a classical example of recursion. So you have like a tree. And you want to print the leaves of the tree, okay? And what you would do is you would write a function. That function prints, prints the current leaf and then goes to the left child and prints all of the left child's leaves. So it's actually like this function uh, would be like, this is the function, print leaves, go to, so, and then print leaves of, the, or like, let's call this function A, and then execute A on your left child, and then execute A on your right child. And if there's no child, return. So that would be like a recursive function. So A would be called first on this one, would print its leaves, then would execute itself, the same function on the left child, which would prompt print its, uh, its leaf uh, or its node, and then this would execute to the left child, would print that, here we would go back, so we would unwind the stack, and would go into this branch, and so on. So this is how recursion works. Um, it's not super critical here, but just to note that this is a recursive call uh, for this specific function. And yeah, this gives us this little nice animation down here, which counts up the like, very two very high numbers. And you can see I can still work on my computer. It's not like doing a burn-in on my CPU. <coughs> Question? How would you, uh, like, say you wanted to, wanted to go at a particular rate, like a rotation per second, how would you have control over that? Well, you can always put um, uh, a weight uh, in there, like you can always like put a, a timeout for a certain number of milliseconds. That would be an option. Is there any way to, like here I can't really tell how often it's refreshing. Well, we can, what we can do is we can log it. <coughs> you could also create like a delta between every refresh and then use that to yes. and well, modulate the values yes, by that. So here we will see pretty <coughs> rapid. You can see how quickly the number rises here. Like we've gone through 2,000 seconds since I tapped that. Uh, 2,000 iterations. So this is very fast. Um, I could uh, slow that down if I, if I like. So one thing I could do here is I could run like I could simply uh, send uh, wait here for a second and only uh, call this request animation frame, not for every frame. That would be an option. What I can do, I, I can also change the speed by changing the update parameter, like the update here. Like if I were to increase that, that would go quicker. There, there so. seems to be a function called set time interval, and if you and you can pass a function into it, and you can also set the time interval, and yeah. the function will be called. And, and yeah, that's perfectly possible. I don't know the all, all the function calls. Uh, but yeah, and here you can see like this is now much quicker because I increased the step size. So this is actually already hard to read. <laughs> and you can see like this is still increasing very quickly. Any other questions about this?
break it down, it makes me nervous. <laughs> okay, so that was animation. Um, and here's a little bit of an explanation about uh, what a recursive function is um, and what this exactly does and so on. Okay, so this was basic DOM manipulation based on, uh, on this document object. Um, and next we will talk a little bit about events. So we have done, like, we've created uh, content interactively, but just by scripting. We haven't had user interaction that influenced uh, the content on, on our website. Um, and that's the next thing that we'll be talking about, JavaScript events. Um, so here is the most simple example possible for events. Uh, and I use two different methods here. I'll just show you what this does. There's two pop buttons. And if I click one of them, it actually opens up an alert box and it says, yes, it's me button one. And if I click the second button, it says, ah, you chose me button two. So this is all it does. Very simple. Um, and so how do we do that? Um, we've talked about the button element, um, and there's two ways of doing that. So we can either specify uh, what, which function is called on click directly in HTML here, or we can give the button an ID and later assign the function in JavaScript. I personally prefer the second method because I think it's cleaner to like, not mix your, like, mess, uh, your function calls with your HTML, but it's up to you. Like, um, so the message me function is like uh, very simple. It just does this alert, and the alert creates this box. And, and in this case, like, the message me is the one that is um, assigned to the first button. Uh, and the other <coughs> one that we do here is this: we get, we identify this element with the ID my button. And you can see like up here that uh, we have this button that has the ID my button. Um, and then we specify. Um, what is in the onClick variable, and what we do here is the first time we use an anonymous function, um, or not truly, really, but we, like here we dynamically assign the function to this variable. So we, we create a function in line in this call here. So you can see document get element by ID onClick. Uh, on so we have first identified uh, the element by ID, and then we have accessed the, uh, like the, the member onClick of it, and now we are assigning it a function. Uh, and the function takes the event. So in this event, you have some information about the, uh, about the object that was actually triggering the event. We will be using this later. And then what we do in here is we simply run this alert box. So this is pretty simple. The two ways of doing that. As I said, I personally prefer, prefer this approach. But um, like I haven't really, um, except for, for it seems cleaner to me, uh, there seems not to be a, like, a strong reason to do so. It's maybe be more robust to refactoring and so on. Okay, so this is how that looks. We've done that already. Pretty simple. Any questions about that? Okay, so um, we can also do other things. Like um, here, we will be using a drop down box of three different values. So a drop down box is, is like a select, um, and then we have the three options. So the idea here is you have your favorite fruits, you have apple, pear, and plum, and I can uh, dynamically change what is shown here. <coughs> okay, again, very simple, but we do a little bit more here. We have like a more complicated um, user interface widget, and we directly manipulate the DOM. It's just, uh, it just not only uh, executing an alert. So we have three different options, pear, apple, and plum. Um, and what you can see here is that we define which of these values is selected. So you can see that the apple is selected. And if I, if I were to change that to the pair, I would say it's selected value pair. And now we would say my favorite fruit is pear. This is kind of the default here. Um, and of course, I could change that to any of these values. And I, of course, could also change the dynamic in JavaScript. Um, and here is, I'm just going to have the output. I, I put my favorite fruit and then I, I add a span, an empty span with the ID fruit. So this is kind of the place where we want to add the text label fruit, uh, the, of the fruit uh, that we have in here again. So this is a placeholder. This is actually created for like adding something with JavaScript later. So first, um, we in initialize the favorite fruit field. So we do document get element by ID fruit and manipulate the inner HTML, each HTML element. So I here I can actually write 
uh, inner HTML code. And then I simply do document get element by ID uh, drop down dot value. And that gives me the value of the selected option in the drop down box. So I'm assigning the selected option, uh, option like this in here to the inner HTML of the element that I have identified by its identifier fruit, which is this span here. So this is actually initializing this. This doesn't do anything interactively at this point. It just sets the, uh, for, like the initial state um, of the website. And now we identify the dropdown and add an, un un an unchange event. So like again, we do document, get element by ID, dropdown, and unchange, we execute this function. And in this function, we do the same thing as we do up here. Document get element by default in our HTML is event. And so here we are actually using this event. So uh, the source, like um, the source element of the event, is the uh, is the dropdown box. So this is a shortcut to accessing the event. We could still do document get element by ID dropdown here instead of this event of source element, but it makes it's like easier, shorter to write to just do event source element value. So those refer to the same thing. And this is how this works. Like we simply can now switch between them and it's immediately updated every time something is changed, this on change event is triggered. So questions? So there's a, mm, quite a bit of um, events. For example, on load that is executed every time a certain element is loaded. You can do on mouse over, on mouse out, on window resize, and so on. There's a list of useful, or there's a list of all events um, in here. So you can say on abort, on error, on focus, on change, on click, on close, on context menu, and so on. So all of these options are possible. On um, key down might be interesting, and so on. So um, you can take a look. And based on these, these events, you can simply like hook, uh, hook up your interaction. Um, and of course, like what we've done so far is we have only um, added events to these form elements. But in fact, you can actually add these events to an arbitrary element in the DOM. So what I did here is I have written a little rectangle in SVG, and every time I click that, it grows and it changes its color. So uh, like a very simple visualization, I just like the colors. Um, Okay, so how does it work? We initialize the SVG with a rectangle of size 10 by um, of size 20 by 20 at position 10, 10. We define a style, so this is pretty straightforward, the same way we've done it. Then I have an array of all the colors I like. These are <coughs> color names. Like you can look up if you just Google HTML color names. There's a couple of colors. Um, of course, you can put your RGB values or your uh, hex values here. Um, then I'm, I have a, like, a little counter to, um, for, for the colors. Um, and then I identify this bar element, which has this ID my bar here. Like here I'm retrieving the specific element and tell it on click, um, execute this function. And now the rest here is this function. Um, so first I retrieve the rectangle, again using event.source element. Um, then I try, I identify the current width. So I ask the rectangle for its for its the width that it currently has, and this is done by um, calling get attribute on the element. And here I define which attribute I'm interested in. That would be width, and that is stored now in this variable. And then I can set the attribute width again, and I am taking the current width and add 10 to it. And here I executed the string method because um, this is supposed to get a string, and of course this would be. Like uh, in this case, that would be a number. And if I, for example, um, didn't do the parse float here, that wouldn't be so great because then what would happen here? And we can see that that won't. Like this will simply uh, not work the way we expect because what's happening here is we are not actually adding the number ten to the current width, but we actually do string concatenation. So this would be 10 plus 10 means 1,010. Uh, so what we need, like we need to really get the number straight here. And we do that by uh, really working with numbers. First float was it? And now again, it works as expected. Um, 
Okay, so we are setting the width here, and then again we are modifying the style, and the style of an SVG element, the fill color is defined by the fill. And here I'm accessing the array, the color array, by color count, modulo 4, so that means every time, like this, this color count is simply increasing infinite, uh, like as, as often as I click, and then I simply do a division before and take the rest, um, and so I can like iterate over this array that way. And this is the result. Yeah, also pretty simple, I guess. Um, questions? Okay. Great. Um, so I guess you have noticed that before, but any of those like examples, and there may be, sometimes there's a little bit more, let's say, boilerplate code in my examples than you would see on the web. Many of the examples simply focus on the, the, the relevant part, but I kind of like the examples to be uh, completely atomic, so you will always be able to go see output a new page and then actually look at the... Um, no, this was not the right one. And then actually look at the, uh, at the uh, DOM here and then you can... This is a completely independent example. You can debug that and you can uh, modify that. Okay. So far so good. We can now write... Uh, we can now manipulate websites and we can use user interaction to do that. So we can do things like uh, create a slider or we can do things like instead of on click, we could do on mouse over, is it? Or on mouse, on mouse over, yes. Um, so if we do that, what happens is every time we like, hover here, we, this increases. So we can do any kinds of effects. For example, if you want to do a highlight, uh, like let's say you want to you want a bar chart and you want to highlight the uh, uh, the bar that your your mouse is currently hovering on, you could do that simply like that. Um, anything, any of these events would be possible here. Okay, so that kind of concludes the introduction to interaction. Uh, and next, I wanted to briefly talk about um, running a web server. So most of the examples we've worked with so far. Um, they work if you just take the HTML file and um, click on them in your file system and open them up and they will just render. Um, this works not all the time uh, for security reasons. So sometimes, especially when you do file operations, so for example if you have a, um, a data in a separate file and you want to read that file, your browser will not allow you to do this from your local drive and that's simply a security feature so that you can't like execute our like that. Um, you, the browser is in a sandbox and is not supposed to access your local file system. There's now an HTML5. There's no methods to actually do this in a safe way. But up to HTML5, that was simply not possible. But still, for most cases, you need to run a web server uh, to actually do the examples. And for your homework, you will also need to run a web server. So there's two different ways of doing a web server. First, you could. Or there's many, many different ways. And if you for your web server, you like the IIS from Microsoft, go ahead. If you want to run your own Apache environment, go ahead. It's absolutely fine with us. I'm just going to show you two simple approaches uh, of running your own web server. So the first one, who of you has Python installed? Show me hands. Okay, if you have Python installed, um, it's super simple. Um, unless you should install Python, but uh, uh, otherwise you should install Python. Um, but there's also another way. So uh, let me. Uh, okay. So all I need to do is run this little command: Python minus m simple HTTP server. And now it tells me, okay, it's serving HTTP on this address, port 8000. So I can simply go to my browser, put in 0 .0 .0, 0 .0, 8000, and I will see all of the uh, examples that we did today in this case, because I actually did it in the root directory of, the, of these examples. And now when I click on any of those, uh, you get the HTML file. So that's all that it takes. Very simple, um, and that's a good approach if you use like anything like Sublime Text Editor or VI or Emacs and so on, this is probably the way you want to go. Uh, I 
I don't, well, not a Mac. I don't, didn't put in my admin keyboard uh, password here. I don't know about Windows, but maybe. Uh, I suspect not, but yeah, I don't really know. So I've never had an issue with administrative privileges, but I've not used the Windows system uh, for a while, so. Um, could be. I'm more concerned about the computers um, you have to try out. I like. I you will have to be able to run a web server somehow. So like, if it's a problem at the University of Utah, so what you can also do is you can use this um, IDEs. Um, this is the next thing I'll show, be showing. But they also run a web server. Um, I think it's not so much the problem for security isn't really about running the web server, it's about giving people from outside access, so not just because you're running a web server locally doesn't mean that other people can access it. Um, so I don't really think it's an issue, but you have to try it. And, um, I don't really have a good solution if that doesn't work, um, other than use your own computer. <laughs> okay, that link is broken. Well, um, Okay, so the other option that you have is um, running a server and debugging with WebStorm. So you can actually use WebStorm, like uh, any other IDE will do the same, but I'm just going to show it to you with WebStorm. Um, just because like, this is a recommended IDE and you can get actually, um, you can get a license for it. So what you can do is you can run your web server uh, like this. So you would simply like... <coughs> Here, like add a new run or debug configuration, like up here in this run uh, option, you like once if you're not in the menu, it's actually active, and you can say debug. Uh, and then all you need to do is point, like name this somehow, uh, point this to um, your the local URL. Um, so you can actually select the file here um, that or the directory that you want to run. And typically, um, so I recommend this approach if you do a bigger project with multiple files, for example, in your final project. So you would pick one single index HTML file that's kind of the starting point of your website. If you develop, like in this example, uh, like I'm doing a lecture here, I'm switching between many, many different completely independent <coughs> files that's maybe not as convenient. Uh, you can still do it, of course. Um, and then all you need to do is to run uh, this, this thing and this will actually um, create um, the website, and now I can interact with it. But what I've done here is I actually set a breakpoint in the editor. Um, and that's pretty convenient, because now you can actually debug within your integrated development environment. So here, like this is the, the mouse event call um, the, uh, that we have, and it actually tells you this is the event mouse event, and this is exactly the code, what, what, what is going on here and I have the current width and so on. So I can interactively see all the variables here. I can hover over like what is the content of event and so on. So all of these features are, are really great to have and you can edit it and it will immediately be reflected. Um, of course you can do this kind of debugging also in the, in the uh, web browser. Um, in the, like if we do that here, we could say go to sources And we could set a breakpoint in this event here. And then when I actually click here, um, I like this the execution stops right here, and then you can check the state, the state of what is going on. Um, which is very convenient if you have a problem. Uh, the only thing that is not so convenient about doing this in the browser is that you can't really edit it live. So you, you now know, okay, this is the state of everything, but you can't modify it. You have to go back to your text editor. And that's why integrating within your editor is, is an even better option. So then I can continue here and I can do the same thing in, in WebStorm. I could simply like, um, take the next step or step into, step out of, or just a step over like here, I'm going stepwise through the program and now I can control the flow of the program. Um, and now I can see, okay, color count, the current state of color count is zero. Um, when I go over the next step, you will see that color count is one. So this is how you can inspect, inspect the variables in real time. And this is a good workflow for, for, for writing programs. Um, and when I'm done, I can say um, play, 
I can then remove the breakpoint, and then I can go back to the browser and keep working on it. So um, it's pretty simple. Um, the only thing that you will have to do is you will have to a have WebStorm installed, set this up like that. Um, again, very simple, and you need to install the Chrome plugin for WebStorm. So like it's the um, WebStorm communicates with Chrome and gets the events and so on, so that you can actually um, use um, Chrome to show the output um, and use WebStorm to debug it. Um, yeah, and then the ideal setup for me, like the best way to code is, is I have here my window, and then on the left I have my uh, the, the WebStorm IDE. I write my code, I immediately see everything, I can debug it, and everything is at the same time in focus. So um, yeah, this is just a, a note on, on the process of how to really work efficiently with this kind of code. Any questions about that? And of course, this works uh, probably with other IDEs um, equally well, um, but just WebStorm is the one I've used and um, the one that you can get for free. Great. So, it's time to talk about D3. Uh, we've talked about it, but not in a very abstract way. So now let's get a little bit um, into it. So, in your homework two, which will be released today, um, you will be doing something very similar to what you did in homework one. Um, you will use the same data set plus the other th uh, three um, versions of Enscombi's quartet um, and create the plots that you created with SVG dynamically with D3. Um, so, um, and most of the things um, that you will need in the homework will be covered today. Uh, some of them uh, probably won't make it into today's lecture, like reading from a file and so on. We'll point you to the documentation you should have. Like it's, it's clearly explained in the book and I will be teaching it on Tuesday, but if you want to like, complete the homework on the weekend, uh, you will have to do some independent uh, study here. So D3 is um, a JavaScript library. So what it does is it takes uh, all of these like convoluted and long function calls on this document object that we've used to manipulate the DOM and make success to them simpler and easier and shorter. Like you've seen, if we look at the, at the code to, mod to modify the stuff, um, this can be pretty like long. So here like document create element, document create text knock, result depend child, and so on. So these are pretty long calls and, 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 and they're not easy to read and if you, like you have to do these for loops and so on. And D3 is actually, like it takes more a declarative approach um, not so much an iterative approach to um, to like defining what your visualization should be doing. Um, and D3 is relatively new. It was published in 2010 by Mike Bostock, um, who was a PhD student or a master student in Stanford. Um, Vadim Orgievsky, who um, is a co like a co-developer of D3, um, and some of the examples that I will be showing today are based on, on uh, his introduction to the D3 lecture, um, and Jeff Hare, who is one of the most famous VIS researchers, like one of the most famous current VIS researchers, who used to be at Stanford and is now at the University of Washington. Um, so we will be hearing uh, about a couple of techniques that Jeff um, actually developed. Um, the, the most important resource for you, in addition to the book, uh, is the D3 <coughs> API reference. So this is like this wiki page on GitHub where every single thing that D3 does is documented. And you, this should always be like your first resource if you want to like understand what is a select, what is a select all, and so on. So um, I really recommend that you use the API uh, documentation, the API reference um, to really learn D3. Um, there's of course examples out there um, and so on. And you should also like read by um, so there's like the API reference that simply like tells you exactly what a specific function does, but you can learn um, a lot by, I'm very irritated that I spelled the name wrong here, but um, you can simply go to like, if you Google for things like bar chart D3, you will immediately get something like this. Um, and this is um, a website that is called Blocks, 
and is actually also by Mike Bostock and specifically made to give like these D3 dem demos. Um, and you can publish, like these blocks are driven by GitHub git gists, and gists are like simple repositories that are public, like it's supposed to be little atomic snippets, not more complicated programs. And so every time you look at the, blo at the block here, you can see the output, and you can actually see what goes into it. Like here, down here, is the complete code. Um, everything that does this, like you have the data file, you have the index HTML that contains the HTML, that contains the styling, and then contains the JavaScript code. So this is really the great thing about web development, that all of the code is public, and, and that you can simply look at how something is done, and it's very, um, very informative to read um, these examples. So whenever you're stuck, um, take a look at the examples and how they do it. Uh, one note though, if you use any code, um, always put your reference, like put the URL in the comments. So like I have seen this and these two lines are as you can see them here and so on. Just to be clear that there's no issue with plagiarism and so on. This is really important for your homework. So if we see like a large block of code that you copied from somewhere, A, first place you shouldn't do it and B, if you didn't put an attribution to it, it's really bad. Okay, so you can, you can on blocks there is uh, simple examples like this bar chart, or there is also more complex examples like this calendar view uh, that is a little bit more complicated. Um, but it really, um, Mike Bostock has like this endless uh, like sequence of blocks here. Some are for maps, uh, some are for algorithms, some are simple visualizations. So you can click on any of those. Um, and simply take a look at how they're implemented, what they do. That was a good random selection. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, so you can actually look at what is happening in the code here. <laughs> it's a little long, but if you... Like your program is going to be of the same length once you have like really spent time on, on writing it and understanding it, it's, it's more obvious. Okay. So, um, there's two ways how you can um, Reference D3. A, if you like to work like offline, you can simply download D3 and put it um, in in the directory of the code you're working on, and then like do this local include. Or you can do this, um, like this is the snippet that you should use for embedding D3 on, on public websites. Um, so this simply points to the D3 library, the current version of it, um, and the benefit of doing that over other things is that the D3 library needs to be loaded and if you use these links they have this content distribution networks um, so that means no when no um, at your website the d3 library will be probably available in the server very close to them so that's more efficient so um, instead of hosting the d3 library on your own server you should always like if you do a public website you should always put these public links in a content distribution network uh, on there. That just simply makes your page load faster, but that's just a minor detail of, of like good be like good development practices on the web. So this is how you include D3. And as I said, D3 is just this JavaScript library. It doesn't do any magic. You can actually look at what it does and you will see that it uses this document, get element by ID, blah blah blah. Um, uh, but it makes things a little bit more interesting. So here is a, a minimal example. Um, a minimal example that I've taken from the D3 website. Um, so what we have here is we have a paragraph, uh, we have a body and two paragraphs. In here. Here's a paragraph and one more. And what I'm doing here is um, instead of like this document select element uh, by uh, tag would be probably the, the correct um, uh, method call or something like that and then put P, I can simply do D3 select P. And now I have exa done exactly the same thing as with this retrieving document.getElementById. It's just a shorter version of it. So D3 select P, 
would select the first uh, element in the first paragraph element in the DOM. And I can then assign it to a variable as I've done here, and then I could set paragraphs.style color steel blue. So this is always another thing. Um, in the standard API, I can only do set attribute, but D3 like abstracts the most common attributes, and then you can say instead of set attribute style and so on, you can simply say element.style and say color steel blue. And here is the example. And one thing to note is that I have only selected the first paragraph. So select only selects the first paragraph, uh, the first occurrence of the element that is specified in here. So let's say I do an, oh, I, guess, I think I have an example from here that does this. Yes. OK, so pretty simple, D3 select instead of this document, get elements by tag name. Um, and instead of set attribute, style, color is steel blue, you use simply D3 style method. Um, and so this is like the selections is something that is very important in D3 and is, uh, if you have used jQuery, that is also like one of the strengths of jQuery. Um, you simply do put dollar, uh, dot, and then your selection. Um, so like, and these selectors, they're, uh, they're important to understand. So like we again use the same class of selectors as we did them for as we did for uh, CSS. So we can specify tags, we can specify classes and IDs. The benefit of D3 compared to the standard API is that we can all use the same method. So we can do things like that. So here we have a paragraph with an ID second. Then we have a paragraph without an ID. Then we have a paragraph that has a class, and then we have a second paragraph that has the same class. So uh, no ID, no class, an ID, and two classes, um, two paragraphs with classes. So first, I'm selecting by tag. So um, D3 select P, so we've seen that, and assign color steel blue. Then selecting by ID, D3 select, and in this case, like we don't need to call a different method. We simply use the same thing as we do in JavaScript uh, in CSS. Use the hashtag, hashtag second, and then we start. We give it the color teal. And then we select by class, and here we again use the same method, but instead of um, um, instead of like select element by class, we simply do dot other, um, and then style it with dark orchid. And so this is what this results in: we have a blue, a teal, and the orchid um, element. But again, the second class element didn't match. Um, so again, select only selects the first element on the website. Um, this is sometimes convenient, and if you, for example, want to select for the body, that's fine, or for the only SVG element that you have, but more often than not, you probably want to be selecting all of them. And this is where it actually gets interesting. So the same example again, with the same paragraphs, four paragraphs here, and then I run D3 select all of the paragraphs and style them in steel blue. And you can see that it actually applies it to all of them. And the interesting thing here is, we didn't do a for loop. So like in, if we did this with the standard API, we would have gotten back a list of all the elements, we would have run a for loop, and we have, would have applied the style to all of these elements. But in D3, what you do is you simply like do this declarative, like all of the elements that match the selection, um, they should have this style. And this is a very, very powerful concept, and this is how D3 essentially works. So you won't write a lot of for loops in D3. It's really, really very much about like, um, we have this selection that represents the subset of the data set and now do that with it and do this in a data driven way. Yes? So, but underneath it's still doing something yes. like a loop. So if you do it that on a really big document, it's gonna take time. Sure, but it's gonna take the same amount yeah. of time. If it's you, just yeah. easier to declaratively. Yes. yes, this is more about really um, making things easy to develop and not so much about performance. But D3 is probably, the implementation uh, is probably more efficient than what you would write, um, just like one-off. Um, so um, it's, it's um, for SVG, um, it's pretty fast. Um, of course, SVG isn't the fastest way to render things. Like there's other libraries, or if you want, like SVG is vector graphics, and you could have like Canvas, which would be the HTML5 pixel graphics, which are faster. Like you can render a million elements in, in Canvas, which you can't in SVG uh, as efficiently. And then of course there is WebGL, which is OpenGL, though, so hardware accelerated, and that's even faster. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will be sticking for with D3 at least for now. In the fourth homework, we will have a WebGL example. Um, 
Okay, so now let's do something here. Like instead of selecting for P, I'm selecting for other. And now we can see that all of the class other actually get highlighted in blue. So this is exactly what we want. And this is exactly how we use this kind of class definition. Okay, so this here explains what I just said about the box modification. Um, so we can also do other things like append. So I, I'll, we can see here we have again these paragraphs, the four paragraphs. In this case, I have removed the classes and identifiers. Now we select all of the paragraphs and then we append a new span with the text, new text in span. So like if I remove this, we get just what we saw before. Um, and again, like we have a selection here. We have selected for all of them, so it applies to all of them. And now we say append a new span with the text, new text in span. So let's take a look at that in the inspector. This is the, this is what it creates. So like this is the original text, and this span here was dynamically added by D3. And this is, of course, this is the true uh, in here. So, this is how we can modify um, content. Um, like in this case, not really based on data, but simply by adding something. And then um, we will talk a little bit more about how we can manipulate dynamically what is in here. So here's a little code snippet that I will be using uh, for the next examples, for all of the other examples that are coming up. Um, that simply lets us um, dynamically um, run this stuff. So like, what this does is um, it adds this little run button here and executes a function. So this is all it does. Um, so you can see we have this button which is appended at the end uh, of the body. Uh, and so we have selected for the body and the append puts it at the end. Um, and then we set the text to run. This is again using D3 here. Um, and on click we run the execute function. And I'm assuming, like, and I'm including this little snippet here um, at the bottom every time. Um, so here is it included, it's, it's stored in run.js and I just didn't want to like, put this code in every single example because the next 20 examples will have exactly the same code. Um, um, so, and what we do here is like all of the D3 examples from now on, they will be inside of this execute function. And all of this button does, all that this button does is execute this execute function. So all of the relevant code is within this execute function. And then once we click here, it does something. And now we'll talk about what it actually is that it does. Um, so I have started out with an SVG here. Uh, we have an SVG with height and width, and then we have three rectangles that I have positioned like down here. <coughs> Let's reset that. Uh, so you can see that these are three different rectangles here. They don't look like a data visualization. They look more like an art piece. Um, so what we want to do is we want to modify them. So let's go for um, selecting the rectangles. So we run D3, select all rectangles. And now we have selected all of the rectangles in here. And this is an artifact that's from when it was the paragraphs, but well, it could be rects. would be a better name. Okay. Um, and this variable now contains the selection with all of the rectangles. And now we set the attributes of the rectangles. And this here is one thing that is really important. So uh, we set the attribute x, x here to zero. And the attribute y doesn't get a parameter, but actually gets a function, like one of these anonymous functions in here. And this is really the thing like, that you should understand today. Um, D3 has these embedded, like, the, when you put this function here, it, it, it passes along two parameters, D and I. Names are by convention. You should always use D and I because everybody uses D and I, but this could be anything. It's just the first and the second parameter. And D is the data payload, and I is the index. So if you have the first element in, uh, the first element in such a, uh, in, in your selection, you would get an i of zero. If you have the second element, you would get an i of one, and so on. So, like this is important, and this is what the, what we're using here. There's currently no d, no d defined, and we'll talk about the d later again. 
but this is really important. So if you have these, like for every single selection, for every, like anything that you do, you have this function, and then you have this data payload in the index. And what you can do is then return, like the, this is, we're setting the white position here, and this executes the function, and the, the return value of the function actually defines the value of, of y. So what we're doing here is we're setting i multiplied by 90 plus 50. So i multiplied by 90. So since we, i is constantly increasing over the selection, this will get bigger and bigger. Um, and then here, 50 is just the offset. And here should be semicolon. Um, and the same thing with the width. Um, so we simply return like i multiplied by 150. Um, and this is, and then here we do some styling. Um, so we've seen the styling. So this is what this does. It takes the first element, it has the smallest index, um, and it sets it to the highest position here and has the lowest height. So the smallest uh, position and the smallest width. And then we have the second one. It has the second largest position because it's multiplied with one. Um, and then um, we have, uh, the, um, yeah, it's, it, the y value is over the second most and then for the third most. So this is how uh, that works. Any questions about that? Because this is really like an important concept here that can be irritating sometimes for people. Okay, so um, if not, we'll start with data. And this is not the first time that we'll actually do something data-driven. Up to now, we've only done um, interesting, um, like we've played around with, with features, but we've never had really data in there. So again, uh, what we have, we start with the same example. We have three SVG uh, rectangles here, uh, which are exactly the same thing, and we'll be using those um, all the time now. And so here we um, select the SVG element, and on the SVG, that's what we store here, and then we actually execute again the selection. So select all the rectangles, which is stored now, like now after this call, we have this selection contains the three rectangles that are currently on there. And um, one thing that is also typical for D3 is this chaining. So any of those um, calls, they will again return uh, the selection. So like DC, D3 select all, of course, directly returns the selection. But if I put an attribute here, it would also return the selection. The reason for that is that I could do this chaining. So I can say like dot attribute x and then because this attribute returns the same thing that it got in, it would actually, like, um, again, be possible to do this chaining. So like, this is the way, um, this is how I, this, this works that nicely with this, this chaining, where you simply call many different functions um, on the same selection. So this here is actually what is the interesting part. So here we're defining the data. And in this case, it's, a, it's, a, it's an array. Um, and it's an array with three values, 127, 61, and 256. And then we set the attribute x to zero, so it starts the, uh, on the on the left. And then we set the attribute y um, to an index, so we use again just the index here. But the interesting part now here is here we're using the data payload for the first time. So here we have this function with d and i, and we return the value of d. So that means this will actually like. For each of these elements, it will take the value at the position, like the first rectangle we will get 127, the second rectangle will get 61, the third rectangle will get 256. Um, and so since we're setting this to the width, we will get the data-driven bar chart here. And this is the basic idea. And if we execute this, we can see that we have a data-driven bar chart for the first time. So modifying this, I'm saying this is 160. And now you can see, was that correct? Probably, yes. Let's do something bigger, 500. Yeah, now you can clearly see like this changes depending on this data element. So I'm just saying this again because it's, it's uh, one of the key concepts uh, of D3. Like if you like supply the data like this, it will simply for every element in its selection, it will apply it in the order of the, of the vector that you have here. And you can access it through this callback function, like through this um, payload of D and I of those two parameters. Um, 
And that is like the, the key concept of how D3 works. And here you, you see that we are applying things to, like we could have, we will see later how we can take arbitrarily long arrays and dynamically create a bar for every single one. And we'll never have to write a for loop. And we'll never have to do any of those tedious calls um, to the standard API. Okay. So what happens if we have more data points than elements? So here, same example, but instead of three elements, we have four elements. So let's um, just run this. And what we can see here is um, a little bit frustrating. It's still only three elements. Sorry. So by default, if you don't do anything else, um, these selections are not dynamically extended. They simply operate on what you have in the selection. So if you have more elements in your data than you have elements in your selection, um, it will simply take the first couple of them and ignore the rest. Uh, of course, this is not what we typically want. We want to be flexible in terms like, we don't want to uh, create a bar chart that only works for exactly so many bar charts. So we want to create a bar chart that works dynamically for any number of bar charts. So how can we do that? and we need to do an enter. Like, again, same boilerplate here. We have, um, again, the, the data with four elements. Um, and then we have the selection, and then we apply the resizing the same way we did it. And here at the bottom, we, uh, we say selection.enter.append rectangle. So this tells us um, for any element that you can't really match up at this point, so for the fourth element in this case, append a rectangle, a new rectangle, and then give the parameters. Um, and here we're setting the parameters. So what this does is that. So now we have four elements, and this is the fourth element is data driven, and we can also try this out with another element here. And so they will all be at the same position. So we don't really see them, but if we were to inspect this element, we could actually see that there's multiple of these rectangles. So you can see there's many of these green rectangles down here. Okay, so this is kind of like, now we have at least as many elements on the page that, as we have in the data set, but we haven't really like assigned them uh, the correct position and the value, and this is because we first did um, like the essentially database formatting, and only later did the append. So we can turn this around. So, uh, or what we can do is we can simply copy this here and put it on here. Um, and what we do now, what we get now, is actually what we expect. So now we have the four data elements, and if I add the fifth data element, I would also get the fifth element. And if I had more, it would be more, but it would be out of the SVG down here. Um, so this is great, but somehow this is not very convenient because I'm actually copying code here. Like, and that's never a good idea. So if I'm changing this here to teal uh, and forget to change it here at the bottom, um, of course, like the new elements won't have to style. So, obviously not a good piece of software engineering practice. So instead, uh, we can do this in a shorter version. Um, so here we can, um, have, we, here we have the selection, and now we can do the selection.enter.append rectangle. And this is the kind of the first thing we do. And now we can actually um, update the regular, the regular selection, and in this case, like after this append, this the selection is joined with the new one. So this is really exactly what we want. Now we have, in this selection uh, in here, we have all of the data elements that we have in this array. And then we can do this data-driven formatting here. And this is exactly what, what our goal was. And again, this works nicely even for more elements. So this is how you can create charts uh, with an arbitrary number of elements. So, what if we don't have um, initialized SVG elements at all, like, like this? 
let's take a look at this. Uh, so what we simply could do here is SVG select all rectangles. And this is where it gets a little bit weird because we are actually selecting something that does not exist. So if we run this, uh, uh, this here, we're like, the select all will return an empty selection, but we are still um, selecting on the rectangles. This is just something that you, like, it's bizarre to select something that doesn't exist, but you can also think of the select all as defining a new selection that you're operating on, and this is actually what it does. So you still have to do the select all, even if there's nothing in there. So you can see, we have an SVG here, but it's empty. So we still have to select for what we want to append here. Then we, we do the data call, so we, we actually define, we bind the data to the selection, um, and then we do the enter and the pen rectangle, and after this, we actually have the selection with the rectangle each, and we can do the formatting here. Um, and this is how that looks like, and we get this exactly what we want. And again, here in this case, this also works for two. Um, so now you can actually create a, a data-driven bar chart um, completely from scratch. Yes? If you uh, selected something like that didn't exist, exist with the class, would that give them that class name? Yes. Okay. Um, but, well, I would try it. I'm not 100% certain. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, when you create a new element, you actually have to assign the class. But yes. you can do that with, the, um, like, after you save a pen, the rectangle, you can also say, give it the class attribute of yes. the class that you want it. Okay. Exactly. But you should, you should still, uh, so I guess you could also select on something completely different here. Um, you shouldn't do that though, um, just out of convention. So this will probably, and I'm not 100% certain now, but if I put that in here, this will probably still work. Yes. Um, so this is just like the select all is merely about creating this, this selection collection. Um, and Vadim, who, who likes to give these talks, uh, um, and he always says, if I ever see this, I'll come and shoot you. Uh, you sh just you should essentially, what you should, you should always select for the, the specific thing that you, that you want to create, just out of convention to make things clear. Um, okay, uh, now let's try to get rid of some elements. So here we have Again, three rectangles on your SVG, um, and we have um, only two data elements. So and this is again the same function, and if we run that, what happens is we have two elements that are mapped to the data, but we have one element that is left here. Obviously, this is not what we want. So we need to take care of how can we throw out elements that don't match to the data anymore. So instead of adding, instead of entering, we need to remove, aka exit. So here we have the selection exit remove here at the bottom. Um, so otherwise this is pretty much the same thing. And if we run that, this is actually removed. So that's pretty neat. Now we can essentially, if we combine this exit and enter, we can transition between um, like any number of data sets. Like if we had, if we had a, like multiple data sets with different sizes, uh, if you use this function now, uh, where we use this combination of enter and exit, uh, we could simply dynamically create these bar charts. Um, so one of the really cool features about D3 is that transitions are baked in. And I, like, when I first developed my like, a visualization framework, I, I did it completely myself, and I spent a fair bit uh, of time of, uh, on doing transitions. And D3 actually makes these this really nice things for free. So here is the transition and duration cause, and I'm just going to show you what this does first. And this is pretty neat because this is just a single call. So just if you missed it, here we go again. So what this does is it takes all of the elements that you have in your selection and like dynamically changes these attributes so that they uh, that you have a smooth transition um, to the new style and position. It will it, like if you take a close look here, it does two things. It first 
it interpolates the color and it changes the position and the size of these elements. So take a look at the color is also fading and it's, all, it's not switching hard, it's really fading dynamically. And all you need to do is to call here transition and then define a duration. And that's all. And if we were to, let's say, make this quicker and say uh, we do only 500 milliseconds or half a second, then that would be really fast. Or if you make, want to make it longer with 5,000 milliseconds, that would be slower. And so doing something like that, uh, like all of the other stuff that we've done so far, that's pretty, uh, like you can do that with the API calls, but here is the first time where we see something that D3 really makes our lives a lot easier. Um, and that of course works also if you switch data. Um, so if you, if you transition between different data sets. So uh, in this case, we, we have missed the enter again. So like the data set here had four elements. Um, but we need to re-add the enter here. Like here we um, add the enter and then we do the transition. And then what we do here is we do a transition first and then we add a second transition. Like after a delay of 3,000 milliseconds of three seconds, we do a second transition and change uh, the value. So like here we define the width as D, so this is exactly as many pixels as there is in the data, but then we, here we modify the width of D by a factor of 1.5, so this will make the bars longer and we're also changing the style to green. Um, and also we're defining an exit and for the exit we're um, defining a transition. So like we set the uh, uh, attribute opacity to one, then we do the transition and after the transition the attribute opacity should be zero, so this should be fading out the element and then we remove it. And this is how that looks. That's it. So this is pretty neat and still not a lot of code here. Okay, I have two minutes left. Um, the last thing I wanted to show is drawing lines. Um, and so um, SV, um, D3 has, like there's two ways you could do this with the regular path element and use this ML syntax that we used in the lecture. Like SVG, append path with everything we do here, and empty SVG, and we're appending a path, so this is very basic. And if we run that, we get this little line chart here. Um, so, but this is not very convenient, so this is not data driven here. Um, and we, we kind of like, we don't want to specify if this uh, like that. And so D3 has a couple of like built-in functions, and here we have defined a couple of points in, uh, in a data driven, like in an, uh, in an object, in an array in an array of objects where you have uh, x and y coordinates for each of these points. And then we use the d3 svg line function and then we define what happens with the x parameter and what happens with the y parameter. And here again we have this day, d, this uh, callback for the data. And here we return d.x and in this case this x refers to this one here and d.y and this refers to that one here. Um, and then uh, what we do is svg append path and here is we run this line function on this array of points and now we get exactly what we want without having to do these uh, annoying uh, uh, manu manual path definitions. Uh, one other cool feature about the, or uh, many other cool features about the svg line method is but you can also do interpolation so you can do a cardinal um, interpolation, so that would look like that, or you can do a monotone interpolation, that would look like that, and then we could have like the basis interpolation, which is the smoothest, like this is a cubic spline. So again, this would be tough to do by your own, if you just like, and, and just is using this SVG line function makes this super easy for you. Uh, there's more uh, more interpolation functions. There's of course more about D3, uh, but this is the end of today's lecture. We'll be talking more about D3 concepts, about scales, about axes, about layouts, and so on next week. But this should really give you a good idea of what D3 is about. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again on Tuesday. So, Just to
mit der CT ist der Vorsitzende. Das ist der nächste Schritt. Ich wollte das hier wieder sehen.